Are proton pump inhibitors such as lansoprazole and Nexium really as dangerous as they are made out to be? As a pharmacist, I'm going to go through the evidence, the conditions where the benefits outweigh the risks and the actual dangers of taking PPIs long term. There will be timestamps in the description box below and after discussing all the benefits and the risks, I will then explain how you can safely reduce and stop your PPI without rebound acid and problems. But before I start, here are my intros and disclaimers. I'm Eloise, I'm a UK pharmacist of 20 years and I'm enthusiastic about clear, accurate information on medicines and supplements that any, everyone can understand. The information I provide is for educational information only and is my own opinion. However, I do my best to base it on the most up-to-date evidence. Always contact your own healthcare professional for individual advice on your own personal situation. What are proton pump inhibitors? These me medication with the generic name ending in prozol, such as ezomeprazole, lansoprazole and pantoprazole, are frequently prescribed with around 15% of the adult population taking them. They are often prescribed for severe stomach bleeding and ulcers and in the protection of the stomach against certain medications such as NSAIDs like aspirin and naproxen. However, many people take them for the relief of symptoms from dyspepsia and reflux, where they are extremely effective, but we need to balance the benefits with the long-term risks. Proton pump inhibitors work by blocking the proton pump in the lining of the stomach that produces the hydrogen proton needed for hydrochloric acid. This acid can then turn the pH of the stomach down to the most extreme level of one and is a dispensable defensive barrier against any microbes in food that could cause illness. It also starts the digestion process in breaking down the food so that the body can absorb the nutrients. However, in some people, there is excess acid in the stomach and it can cause problems such as indigestion known as dyspepsia and it can also travel up the esophagus as reflux and then this acid can actually erode and cause damage which can in turn even lead to ulcers and bleeding. There is no real difference um, between the PPIs on clinical effectiveness or safety if you are looking at equivalent doses. However, there is a dose response and lower doses do not provide the same protection and higher doses do, but obviously come with more side effects. There is also the note that Omeprazole and ezomeprazole are very similar, as in omeprazole comes in two different molecules. One that you can think of as a left hand and one that you can think of as a right hand. And they realised that only one of these was actually effective in the body. And so they decided to work out a way of filtering out just one of the isomers. And that's where you get the term ezomeprazole. So, 20 milligrams of ezomeprazole is equivalent to 40 milligrams of omeprazole, taking only the 20 milligrams that actually works. So that is to bear in mind that when we are talking about equivalent doses, and we usually get told there's either a low dose of a PPI or a high dose, and then sometimes there is a super high dose that's often used when you, for H. pylori eradication or for the first few weeks following the treatment of a GI bleed or ulcer. When can proton pump inhibitors be beneficial? They can be essential and life-saving in certain emergencies such as gastric perforation where the stomach ulcer is bleeding and the PPI can help the stomach repair and heal. Over the last few decades, PPIs have massively reduced the problems associated with gastric bleeds and complications, and they have been used for many other indications as well. Some of the indications where the benefits of the long-term use of PPIs outweigh the risks include certain conditions such as Barrett's esophagus, zollen ehlinson syndrome, um, esophageal stricture dilation, severe adjophys which is inflammation of the esophagus, which has been complicated by past strictures, ulcers or hemorrhage, so bleeding and um, damage there. 
and also for uh, people that have had previous GI bleeding, perforation or hemorrhage, as these people are at a high risk of this recurring. So anything that we can do to reduce the potential damage in there and to allow any problems to continue to heal is a benefit. Knowing that certain medication can result in GI bleeding um, when taken long term resulted in the PPIs being investigated and proven to be effective in providing gastro protection for those people that need to take other medication long term. These um, medication include NSAIDs such as aspirin and naproxen, antiplatelets, so that includes the low dose aspirin and clopidogrel, anticoagulants such as warfarin and the newer DOAX such as apixaban and adoxaban, oral corticosteroids such as prednisolone um, which can be taken as short courses for inflammation but some people have to take long term if they have got chronic autoimmune conditions and some antidepressants such as the SSRIs and SNRIs so these are sort of the fluoxetine um, sertraline and venlafaxine. Now, not everybody that takes these medications necessarily needs to have gastroprotection with a PPI because they may not actually um, be at risk of that if they are young and fit and healthy and don't potentially have any other issues other than what they're currently being treated with. However, as people get older, their risk of problems um, taking these um, medications um, can increase. So especially people that are over 65 or over 75, if they are having to take any of these medication, then you re really need to think, do they need to take them or do they need to have protection um, with a PPI? Also people that have had previous problems with gastric um, ulcers or um, problems with such as dyspepsia and such like, they may be at more risk of having um, GI bleeds on these medications. So it could be considered that they take it. Plus people that end up needing two or three. So if they are on long-term um, oral corticosteroids and then they also need to have in added an antiplatelet, then they are a, a double risk and so may need to have PPI protection added. Another time that it's beneficial to take um, proton pump inhibitors is during the eradication of H. pylori. Now, H. pylori is a bacteria that um, affects many, many people. Um, quite often, people have it transferred to them um, during their childhood, but it can cause um, indigestion, dyspepsia that can actually lead on to causing um, gastric bleeding and even lead on to um, causing um, gastric cancers and they have found that in, in suppressing the acid during the eradication of H. pylori using two or three antibiotics really does improve the effectiveness of those antibiotics. Now moving on from that, um, PPIs are now commonly used for many people who have dyspepsia and who also have um, GORD, which is um, gastroesophageal reflux disorder, which is where the acid in the stomach is um, going up the esophagus and causing damage in the esophagus. Now, there is some um, benefit in the long term in reducing the amount of damage that is being caused by the acid in the stomach um, and in the esophagus, and whether that actually um, reduces and prevents um, long-term GI um, bleeding and GI problems but we need to find out where the line is in just treating simple dyspepsia or simple GORD that could go away with just lifestyle interventions to where is the line that the dyspepsia or the GORD is severe enough that they need to be treated long term with a proton pump inhibitor. Now to make that decision we need to really be aware of what the risks are of long-term proton pump inhibitors. Let's move on to the side effects and risks of um, proton pump inhibitors. Um, for the first decade or so with um, these new medications, they seem to be extremely safe and extremely well tolerated. There was very little side effects. Most people um, 
could tolerate them. Few people maybe got headaches or actually got nausea or um, stomach issues from them and diarrhea. But in the most part, people tolerated them really well and there was very little serious adverse effects. Maybe the occasional person with anaphylaxis type reaction that happens with all medications, but it was generally seemed as though these new medications were brilliant and they were actually reducing the amount of side effects and problems of other medications. So they were being added in to more and more people. So these people obviously had other comorbidities because they were already being treated with other medication. So after quite a few years, they decided to do some long-term studies, what are known as observational studies, where they look at um, millions of people that have been taking medication and look and compare them to the normal population and see if there's any differences. They were really hoping that these new medications were obviously um, going to reduce the risk of people dying from GI bleeds and GI complications, and that's what they were looking for. But they actually found out that actually all-cause mortality for people on the PPIs was actually worse than that of the general population, which seemed to be a bit counter intuitive. So they had to do some much more deep diving to find out what the reasons are. Now, you've got to realise that, yes, there are these risks, but they only actually came to light once we were doing studies, observational studies, on thousands and millions of people, which means that for an individual, most of these risks are very unlikely. They are only actually happening in one in a few thousand and maybe one in even hundreds of thousands. But there were some risks that were being shown, one being an increased mortality in older patients. And obviously these were patients that had other comorbidities and other problems going on and other um, medication, which could also be the reason. But a few other. I'm going to go through some of the side effects and risks that have been linked to the long term use of the proton pump inhibitors. Um, some of them are in increased risk of infections, such as Clostridium difficile, which is an intestinal um, infection causing severe diarrhea, um, community and acquired pneumonia, which is a chest infection. It also can increase the risk of bone fractures and osteoporosis, increase the risk of hypomagnesinemia, which is a low magnesium level, um, increase the risk of vitamin B12 deficiency, um, also low sodium levels known as hyponatremia, as well as a few other very rare things like acute interstitial nephritis, which is um, an effect on the kidneys. And then even then when people try and come off the PPIs, one of the rebound side effects is rebound acid hypersecretion syndrome. I'm now gonna go through a few of these in detail. Firstly, I'm going to cover Clostridium difficile infections, which is a very severe bacterial overgrowth in the intestines that causes extreme diarrhea that can be life threatening. And although there are plenty of other risk factors, there does seem to be a link that PPI use can disrupt the gut flora in the intestines and increase the risk of Clostridium difficile. And for those people that have had a previous infection with Clostridium difficile, there can be a 40% increase in the recurrence of infections. Now, there are plenty of other risk factors for Clostridium difficile, which is usually following the use of broad spectrum antibiotics, such as sort of clindamycin, cephalosporins, quinolones and coamoxiclav. And if ever you have any causes of these antibiotics, you need to be aware that any severe diarrhea following it needs to be followed up. But also people with advancing age, other inflammatory bowel diseases or being hospitalized for any reason also increases the risk of um, Clostridium difficile. And so for older people who have got the higher risk of Clostridium difficile, you need to really be looking and seeing whether they should be on a long-term PPI alongside this. Back in 2010, there was a meta-analysis that confirmed that there was an association between the long-term use of PPIs and the risk of getting community-acquired pneumonia, which, as I said, is a severe chest infection. And this has only been followed up with more population-based um, studies um, reinforcing this link. 
And this is thought to be the fact that we need stomach acid to actually help kill any bacteria and infections that are in the throat. And that's not just our esophagus, but also into our trachea. And it is part of our immune system and our defence to actually have acid in our stomach. Um, the risk of bone fractures in people that are on long-term PPIs was became significant enough that the um, Medicines Health and Regulatory Authority, the MHRA, actually released an alert back in 2012 to actually consider the, the long-term use of PPIs in those people that are at high risk of bone fractures. They found that high doses over long durations of time of greater than a year can actually increase the risk of fracture by 10 to 40 percent above the baseline and so they should always be used in caution with people at a high risk of bone fractures and that if their people do have the risk of osteoporosis that they should be following the current guidelines to ensure that they have the adequate intake of vitamin D and calcium and also whether they should be having a bisphosphonate alongside that to help ensure that the bones stay strong. Our gastric acid is needed to cleave vitamin B12 from ingested dietary proteins and enable it to be absorbed. Therefore, PPIs which suppress gastric production can lead to malabsorption of vitamin B12. A large case study um, of more than 200,000 people found that there was a significantly increased risk of vitamin B12 deficiency associated when PPIs were taken for two or more years. This increased risk was at 65%. The same study also found the 25% increased risk with the use of the H2 antagonists, such as ranitidine. Although routine monitoring of vitamin B12 isn't needed with all people taking PPIs, People that are at risk of the deficiency as showing signs of anemia or are malnourished should be tested, as well as those people that have other medications that may affect vitamin B12 levels, such as metformin. Another deficiency due to malabsorption associated with PPIs is hypomagnesemia, which is a low magnesium. Um, the severe cases have been reported infrequently and I have actually seen them in my own clinical practice, although the actual incidence is unknown. So for people that are on prolonged treatment with PPIs who also take other medications that can affect magnesium levels, such as digoxin, diuretics, they should be monitored for magnesium if they are struggling with any potential symptoms such as leg cramps. In this section, I'm going to cover strategies for reviewing and titrating down and stopping doses of the proton pump inhibitor, if that is most appropriate for you. Firstly, I do have to say that you do need to have discussions with your healthcare professional for the reason why you are taking your proton pump inhibitor. And if there is particular reasons why your stomach needs protection, either from other medications or because you've got a history of severe problems in your stomach. However, if you are just taking it for dyspepsia, indigestion or for mild gourd, so esophageal reflux disease, then you may wish to try and reduce the dose of your PPI and even stop it. This can be very difficult and a trial back in 2006 showed that it is, can be successful in 27 people, 27% uh, of people who are on long term PPIs, but a lot of people really struggle to get off them. And it can be significantly more difficult for people with God where the reflux is um, traveling up the esophagus. So firstly, you would be wanting to put your body in the best position and not be having any factors in your lifestyle that could be making your dyspepsia or um, gourd worse. So these are things like trying to lose weight if you are significantly overweight, stopping smoking, reducing alcohol consumption because alcohol can relax the, the sphincter and increase the um, production of gastric acid, stop or reduce any intake of any food or drink that actually worsen your symptoms. Now, not all foods, um, not all of these foods cause increased symptoms in all people. Some people can take them with no problems, but other people you may find that they are significant. These are usually things like fatty foods, spicy foods, and caffeine containing food and drinks such as coffee and chocolate. 
Um, if you can make sure that you eat meals at regular times and avoid having very large meals or meals late at night, this will help with the aid, the digestion of stomach, the, for the stomach and for the stomach not to be overloaded. Also avoid bending down or lying down immediately after eating when your stomach is full. Um, you can use, if you are, when you're coming off the PPI, try and use either an antacid or an alginate just um, when needed, especially sort of just before bedtime, if that's when your worst symptoms are. And this can help reduce the amount of acid that is there. Also, um, to it, when if you do particularly have problems when you go to bed and it's the laying down that causes the acid to reflux up your esophagus, you can actually higher the um, end of the bed where your head is um, by about four to six inches, 10 to 20 centimetres, just by um, putting some blocks under the edge of the bed and having your body at that angle can help reduce the amount of reflux. Once you have your symptoms of your dyspepsia and God under control with your lifestyle changes and you feel that you're ready to start coming off your proton pump inhibitor, you need to realize that stopping the proton pump inhibitor will result in your body suddenly trying to produce extra acid because the proton pump inhibitor will have been pushing and pushing down your acid production and pushing that down. And like if you were to sort of force your hand down, as you um, suddenly release that pressure of forcing it down, it'll zoom back up in the opposite direction so as soon as you stop taking the ppi your body had been fighting against that ppi and suddenly will be producing more acid and so to start with your symptoms can get significantly worse before they then get better as your body then realizes i don't need to overproduce acid i can go back down to a baseline so to start with you'll want a gradual reduction of your proton pump inhibitor so ask your healthcare professional what strength um tablet or capsule you are on and whether it comes in a smaller tablet or capsule so whether you can be stepped down to a smaller dose and then if once you are taking the smallest tablet you can then start sort of spreading them out so as i would do it if you were taking a high strength twice a day you would then drop down to the low strength twice a day for a week maybe two depending on how, whether your symptoms are starting to occur. Then after being on them twice a day, um, go down to just dropping it down to once a day. Now, most people find that taking the once a day in the morning provides the, um, the best cover for during the day, because although people can have the most symptoms at night, these um, they can take two to four hours to actually get working. So if you were to take them at night time, they're not actually going to be working until the middle of the night. So that's why most people find that taking the dose in the morning when you are taking it once daily is best. So reduce down to the lowest strength once a day in the morning. Once you're on that, you can then consider gradually um, reducing the frequency. So you can go to taking it every other day. So having a day, with it then a day without obviously on the day without some of your dyspepsia or god symptoms may start showing through so obviously if you can keep up with the, the lifestyle changes to to keep on top of it that is great but it may be worth you having an alginate bar this is a, a raft um forming um antacid um made out of alginates which actually comes from seaweed um, usually the brand name is Gaviscon, but it can also be known as Peptac or Acidex here in the UK. But most um, supermarkets have their own brand of alginate and it usually comes as a liquid that you take. It can be quite gloopy and sticky, but it actually floats as a raft on top of the acid in your stomach to suppress that and also prevent it going up into your esophagus and causing that damage and irritation in your esophagus. And you can usually take doses of that up, up to four times a day. You only need a one spoonful, although I am aware that many people don't even bother with the spoons because it's that gloopy. They just take a gloopful. Um, so following on from that, you'll, you'll have taken your PPI down to every other day. And when you're finding that you're not getting as many symptoms on that alternative day, you can then um, increase the um, job the distance between them to every third day 
And once you've re- increased every third day and are not getting many symptoms showing through, you can then um, stop taking it. And then you may discuss with your healthcare professional whether you want to just keep um, some of the proton pump inhibitor to take as and when needed. So when your symptoms are bad, maybe it is when you've gone through um, some stress or some problems or when your diet has um, not been on par and you, you've eaten some of the foods that irritate it, that you have just the PPI just for one or two days when you need it or just to continue taking an alginate um, liquid or even an antacid. But discuss that with your healthcare professional on how you can maintain having the lowest effective dose for yourself. If you have found this video interesting, please like and subscribe and leave your comments below. Also have a look at my previous videos on why asthma still kills or the bizarre craze of coffee enemas. Thank you for watching.